Ryan Neal, County Agent in Benton County, Arkansas. I'm going to cover some of the basics of drip irrigation in the blueberry field. Often, when water is limited, growers will opt to use drip irrigation rather than overhead. You usually see farms using the thicker wall drip line rather than the more disposable drip tape. Making a pretty simple spool out of pipe and plywood, this drip line can easily be put out with the plastic mulch layer. I use the drip line with inline emitters every 18 inches that puts out roughly a half a gallon per hour per emitter. Research has indicated that the two sides of the plant don't share water and nutrients well, so two lines of drip, one on each side of the plant, is advised. This also facilitates the burning of the planting hole since there is not an irrigation line down the middle of the bed. Drip irrigation allows for a more precise fertilizer application, especially under the landscape fabric where it would be hard to apply otherwise. I've mentioned earlier that the cost to establish an acre of blueberries can cost as much as $13,000 per acre. Of this, about 20% of the establishment cost is in drip irrigation. Water needs of the blueberry plant vary depending on temperature, sunlight, wind, and time of year, but typically the equivalent of 1 to 2 inches of rainfall is required per week. A guess of how long to run a drip irrigation system depends on spacing of rows, emitters, and flow. For one acre inch of water, you would need 27,156 gallons. By dividing this by my 10 foot row spacing and half a gallon per hour emitters every 18 inches, I get a run time of 17 and a half hours per week. Rather than running drip irrigation for a long time at once, it is preferred to pulse the system for short intervals more frequently in order to get horizontal movement of water in the soil. Other things to note about irrigation include the salinity and calcium content of the water you'll be using. It is advised that growers new to drip irrigation Consult with a specialist when designing a system. Important calculations of any system include flow, pressure, row length, terrain, and the mineral content in the water. Typical drip irrigation systems include a backflow prevention to keep anything from your farm going back into the well or municipal source, a filter to prevent clogging of emitters, a pressure regulator, and a vacuum breaker. This slide shows a rather complicated setup for fertigation, or putting fertilizer in the irrigation water. Moving left to right, there is a 9 volt battery powered controller linked to the battery operated solenoid valves. This is a setup on city water and flow is limited, so zones are only about half an acre in size. Downstream of the valve is a Venturi type injector that sucks solution from a bucket as water flows to that zone. This allows each zone to have a customized fertilizer application. It is advised to have a screen filter below the fertilizer injection site so any debris can be removed before clogging drip emitters. It is also important to have pressure gauges up and downstream of the fertilizer injection site so the system can easily be monitored to make sure everything is running properly. Petiole sampling is typically done within two weeks of harvest. Labs usually ask for about 50 leaves from the middle of new canes. Petiole sampling is a great way for growers to dial in their nutrient needs. In Arkansas, this test costs $20 and tests for all the macro, secondary, and micronutrients. If done on the same variety and same time of year, a grower can track nutrient levels and fix any deficiencies in the plant before the end of the growing season. It is best to address any nitrogen deficiencies by the end of July to prevent too much growth going into winter. 
Popular nitrogen fertilizers include urea or ammonium sulfate. Both dissolve readily in water and contain the ammonium form of nitrogen rather than the nitrate form which is not recommended for blueberries. Potassium and magnesium sulfate can also be put in through the drip lines to address those deficiencies as well as most micronutrients. Complete fertilizers such as the one listed here on the right can be easily dissolved in water but are likely not going to have the exact right concentrations of nutrients. Commonly these fertilizers can contain too much manganese or nitrate nitrogen and can cause surplus or even toxicity to the plant. Since this system is on city water and that water has a pH of 7.8, a sulfuric acid injector has been added. The goal of this is to lower the irrigation water from 7.8 to 4.5 which helps prevent iron chlorosis. There are less expensive options out there but this one costs about $4,000 and uses a high concentrate sulfuric acid costing about $50 per acre per year. Note that high concentrations of sulfuric acid are very dangerous to handle. Broadcasting a maintenance application of pelletized sulfur would be a cheaper and safer approach to maintaining a desired pH. This should be done according to soil test but shouldn't exceed 400 pounds per acre per year to establish plantings. The following slides were all provided by Bill Klein in North Carolina and we'll go over some typical drip irrigation systems from across the world. For many years this was the typical setup for a drip irrigation system. This grower used a rigid plastic tubing for irrigation and inserted a drip emitter near each plant. The downside of such a system is these emitters can easily get caught and dislodged. It also is time consuming to insert the emitters in large plantings. More commonly used today are the inline pressure compensating drip emitters that are less likely to get caught on anything or waterlogging the soil around individual plants. Water quality needs to be better in order to reduce the risk of emitters clogging. This is done with the use of sand, screen, or disc filters. Drip irrigation may be used to temporarily establish plantings on sandy soil even where overhead irrigation will be used in the long term. This farm laid the drip lines on top of the weed fabric. This allows a grower to easily monitor the lines and emitters. The downside may be varmint damage to the line or reduced infiltration of water through the fabric. These organic soils in Chile have the emitters placed under each individual plant due to the decreased movement of water horizontally in the soil. Here's a picture of a farm in Spain that incorporated both built-in emitters and a double line system. Thank you and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Mm -hmm.